we are continuing to get our heads around the fact that the world has changed uh, in, in so many dramatic ways. Uh, in, in my Morning Shots newsletter, uh, I quote Ann Applebaum writing in The Atlantic mm -hmm. saying, uh, don't be fooled mm -hmm. into thinking that this is just yeah. a continuation of the same old cycle. Mm -hmm. This is something much mm -hmm. worse. It is something uglier. It is as if ISIS has been reborn. Um, and so we'll, we're going to be talking about that at great length. We are joined today by Steve Inskeep, co-host of NPR's Morning Edition and the author of a new book out just last week, Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America. And I have questions about that, Steve. I, I, have, I have questions about Lincoln succeeding in a divided America because there was that whole Civil War thing. There, there were was eight, a little Civil War thing. Eight, there was like 800,000 Americans <laughs> that died during yeah, that civil yeah. war yeah it's pretty bad and yeah. I, I you know if 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 i might if you want to talk about this now yeah um i i am happy to have that <clears throat> excuse me i am happy to have that raised because i am not saying in this book that abraham lincoln was a can we all get along guy or yeah. kiss and make up guy right. or peace at any price mm -hmm. or compromise right. at any price what lincoln did though was when the South made war on the United States, on the Union, when the South rose in rebellion, he worked to build as broad a, as possible a coalition to uphold the Constitution. He didn't try to get along with everybody, but he talked with everybody. He listened to mm -hmm. everybody. He empathized and understood everybody he could, and he made all the allies he could, which is what democracy is about. Well, you, you make the observation, I think it's the first line of the book, that Abraham Lincoln was a politician. And, and being a politician has become a dirty word these days. And, and, and obviously, we're, we're thinking a lot these days about, you know, what is statesmanship? What are politics? Uh, what are we looking for? And so you emphasize the fact that Abraham Lincoln was a politician and was yeah. willing to get into the messy business of politics. He didn't yeah. mind sitting in a room and cutting deals uh, that might have been a little sketchy in, in different, yeah. in different yeah. contexts. Yeah, a little sketchy, yeah. dealing with people that are can feel morally perilous to deal with. We do have a very <laughs> negative image of politicians. We have certain politicians whose behavior encourages us to have a very right. negative <laughs> image of the profession. Um, but I think sometimes... We disrespect the wrong things about politics. We have this view, and I think this is true on the left and the right in somewhat different ways. The parties are not the same, but they each mm -hmm. have a variation on this, a feeling that if you talk with the other side, if you deal with someone right. who differs with you at all, you are weak, you are naive because they're never going to change their mind, you are even morally right. tainted by the association with the other person. But the reality is that in a democracy, that other person who is wrong still has a vote, which is the way it ought to be as long as we're going to have a democracy. And so you have to deal with them because they are a person with power, mm -hmm. a little fragment of power, perhaps. But you have to deal with them on some level or outnumber them, defeat them. Yeah. And outnumbering them may call upon you to make allies that you may not consider to be perfect. And I think Lincoln definitely understood that he needed allies that he didn't agree with on everything, yeah. but maybe even just one out of 10 things they could work together. Well, he also understood that, that politics and government were deadly serious things. And we, we live in this very unserious time um, where, you know, you, you think about the things that we have been debating, the, the kind of, you know, food fights we've been having. Uh, the, the sort Are of you suggesting that it's unserious to overturn, say, the Speaker of the House of Representatives without anybody lined up to be the replacement? Is that the kind of thing? Radical. It, it's, a, it's a radical thought. But I mean, we have an entire class of politicians that don't think that politics is about actually doing anything. It's all about performance. It's all about the clicks. It's all about the dopamine hits. And, you know, you go through all of the ephemera and the trivia and just the, the personal back and forth. And, and you would think that this week would be one of those massive reality checks. Look, the world is a deeply dangerous place. You know, we are seeing this axis of evil rising up and, and that maybe we have been feeling that we can indulge this uh, this, this kind of uh, politics of performative demag demagoguery because we've been so complacent, right? That we can burn things down without consequences. And and so this is a, the, the contra what's interesting about this book is the, is the contrast between the politics of someone like Abraham Lincoln and and what and, and the and the politics that we are unfortunately having to endure right now. 
because he understood that there were deadly consequences. It was not just a show. You just couldn't say some, you know, throw some shit up against the wall and then go on cable television that night, you know, to try to raise funds off of it. That was yeah. not what government was. I mean, I've been very interested in the course of Kevin McCarthy, yes. the <clears throat> former House Speaker, because there have been a couple of moments this year where he acknowledged the seriousness of events. There was a period in which mm -hmm. he was trying to accommodate his right wing and accommodate his right wing right. and keep his job and saying things that appeared to be untrue and yeah. on and on and on. But then the debt ceiling approached and he made a deal, which is what is necessary. It is the system we have in politics. I won't even say, because I'm a journalist, that it was the right thing or the wrong thing, but it is the normal and expected thing. It is the way the system is supposed to work. This happened again on September 30th. The government is supposed to stay mm -hmm. open. There are serious things to deal with. He could not get agreement on his own side, so he made a deal with the other side, which is the kind of thing that you do that is the normal and expected thing in a democracy. It's recognizing the seriousness of the situation. But the second of those times, he had just enough of his colleagues in the House who had a different idea of things, that you should never compromise, right. that you should never make a deal, that there's never a moment that the overriding needs of the country are greater than my personal right. view of what my party should do, even if I can't really express what that is. No. And so, it, and, and here we are, this is the, the moment that uh, has, has been coming for so long and it's probably going to get worse. Uh, interesting. You, we bring up uh, Kevin McCarthy today because Kevin McCarthy is uh, not willing to let this particular crisis uh, pass. And, you know, the week out, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I, I'm not a betting man on these things anymore. My, my, my prediction skills are quite limited. Uh, a week after he becomes the first speaker in history who's to be ousted, he's essentially saying he's willing to come back because there's a crisis in the Middle East. And maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still here, which, by the way, is, I would say, unlikely, but not impossible, because right now nothing is impossible. Right. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, this morning on the day that we're talking here, we yeah. spoke with Susan Davis, our excellent congressional correspondent, who sounded skeptical that McCarthy could round up the votes. There's still that hardcore that dethroned him once who could dethrone him again. But there are also a few lawmakers who are saying, I'm not going to vote for anybody but Kevin McCarthy. And who knows what could happen? Right. We have no idea. Yeah. I mean, the key is how do you get to 218 or 217? I, I lose track of how many votes you need to get given the given the vacancies. Nobody is really close to that. So uh, let, let's come back to that just a little bit later. And I also want to come back to, to Lincoln a, a little bit later, because this moment that we're in right now where we are watching the world order be, I, I would say, certainly uh, transformed. Um, any any hope that the Middle East was going to become peaceful, that there were going to be new accords, that were going to usher in a new era um, of kumbaya, um, completely just de 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 destroyed. Um, the world seems to be lining up behind Israel for the moment. We know that the retribution is going to happen. So, give me your sense a little bit of of where we're at. I, I know that you. Um, that you, you, on Monday, you spoke with Ron Dermer, uh, the former Israeli ambassador to uh, to the United States, and and he put this in some context. Uh, he he put this in the context of uh, uh, of it being Israel's nine eleven, which we discussed on the podcast yesterday. So tell tell me what he said. Yeah, yeah, I've had an opportunity to visit Israel and the West Bank and Gaza over the years, and have interviewed uh, Netanyahu over the years a number of times. I've tried to pay attention mm -hmm. to that to that story. Um, it really is striking what we learned about Hamas over the weekend. Um, I was last there in 2018, mm -hmm. which was an occasion you may recall this. There were Hamas people lashing out then, and their efforts were so pathetic compared to Israel's power that it was almost sad. There were mm -hmm. random unarmed civilians effectively marching into machine guns. There were people sending kites over the Israeli lines, hoping some kind of incendiary device would would set a fire. I mean, really, really uh, weak ways to lash out at Israel. And we discovered over the weekend that they were far more capable, I think, than anybody thought, that they had developed more capability over the last couple of years. Uh, the brutality of this is hard to get your mind around. The targeting of civilians is hard to get your mind around. And I mean, I've been around. I, was, I covered the Pentagon on 9-11. I get that people do what people yeah. do, but it's still, I, I never get used to it. I never am unsurprised that that someone would kill women and children or take hostages in the way that, that Hamas has done. 
And then, yes, uh, on Monday, we interviewed Ron Dermer, who's a close advisor to Netanyahu, was the ambassador mm -hmm. to the United States, is now their minister for strategic affairs. And one of the questions in my mind going into this interview, Charlie, as yeah. it would have been yours, I'm sure, is what about civilian casualties? How are you going to strike this densely yeah. populated area without killing a lot of innocent civilians? And he effectively preempted my question by saying, we're going to do something very, very forceful and we're going to kill civilians and it's just going to happen and you better deal with it. You better accept it. And he demanded the support of the world in spite of his expectation that civilians will be killed. I'm hard pressed to think of another interview where someone has been that frank about the reality of damage to civilians. And of course, the Israeli defense minister has said, we're cutting off food, we're cutting off water, we're cutting off electricity to a couple million people. Mm -hmm. uh, it is an excruciating situation, uh, the solution to which I certainly don't know. And there are hostages. There are hostages yeah. in, in Hamas's hands, which obviously complicate this tremendously. You know, there was once a time when uh, was the Israeli policy that we do not negotiate <laughs> with terrorists at all. And I'm hearing a lot of that uh, again, that that if we negotiate for these hostages, we will simply have more hostages. So w what do they do? W what happens now? What are the prospects you can rescue these people? I mean, this is going this has been horrible. But it seems yeah. likely with your description that it's going to become even more horrible. Yeah. I mean, one possibility is that they do attempt to rescue, right? And mm -hmm. again, we're, we have no, I have no inside information. Yeah. And if, if I did, it would be them. probably wrong of me to talk about it in public. And I don't have inside information. But we know that the Israeli military uh, has a lot of capabilities. Mm -hmm. They, in fact, have a history of rescuing mm -hmm. hostages on more than one occasion. Netanyahu himself. Um, Part of his life story is rescuing hostages who were held on a plane, being involved in that that right. operation. It's the opening of his biography, which I got a chance to talk with him about last year when that in, was published. Entebbe, his autobiography, his memoir. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The Entebbe yeah. rate. Mm -hmm. And so there and, and that was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but there remember. have been other occasions over the years. So I don't regard it as impossible that the Israelis would go in and try to get anybody they can. But it's going to be very difficult. For the very reason that Dermer was forecasting civilian casualties, because it is a crowded urban area. It's not an airplane alone on a tarmac. You have no idea what situation you may be going into. But that's one way this gets solved is a rescue. But if it doesn't get everybody, if that fails, then you have excruciating decisions to make if you were the prime minister of Israel. OK, let's talk about the prime minister of, of Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu, who's been around a very, very long time, a veteran politician, uh, has had his challenges um, at the moment. You know, he obviously is trying to rally the world around his support. But the failure of intelligence, the failure to stop this attack is really extraordinary. And it would be extraordinary for anyone but especially for someone who's been around as long as Benjamin Netanyahu. So what is your sense in Israel? Are they looking at Likud and saying you had one job? You had one job, which was to protect us. And this is at least, at least you know, well, what do you think? No, no, that is one of the reactions. And I'll just mm -hmm. report yeah. here. Our correspondent, Daniel Estrin, is on the ground in Israel. Really, really excellent uh, reporter. Um, and he immediately, in talking with people who lost relatives and talking with people who... Mm -hmm have hostages now in Gaza, has found extreme anger mm -hmm. with the government. Why would they allow this failure? Yeah. That, um, I'm trying to remember back to the fog of 9-11 in the United States. And there certainly was anger uh, yeah. at the U.S. government for this failure and anger. Why was, why was George W. Bush reading to a kindergarten class yeah. or whatever questions people asked? But there, I remember a very wise statement by Tom Ricks Maybe he's been on this program at some mm -hmm. point. The uh, writer yeah. about military yeah. affairs and now historian, friend of mine, wonderful guy. He came on our air after 9-11 and he said, I'm not sure that I would want to live in a country that was ready for 9-11. Meaning mm -hmm. that the security that would have been necessary to prevent that and foresee this very creative and horrible attack um, would have made it almost a totalitarian state. That was his, uh, his view. He would rather live in a mm -hmm. free country and face the risk than live in an unfree country and not face the mm -hmm. risk. So there were, I think there were people who um, had that perspective. And there were also people, of course, who supported George W. Bush's response to the attacks. His mm -hmm. approval ratings were like 90% right. and remained that way for a year or two. Um, this seems to be a different immediate reaction. 
Netanyahu's own government had divided the country, was pursuing an agenda that a very large number of Israelis opposed, um, that they were in the streets over for months and months and months, which he modified somewhat but would not abandon. Um, and that led to anger against Netanyahu. And also, uh, the idea of an attack out of Gaza is not a surprise. No. The scale and ferocity is a surprise. Yeah. At least it surprised me. I mm -hmm. did not realize they had that kind of capability. I don't think anyone but did. if you're the Israeli military, that's yeah. what you're paid to know. Right. And they know they knew just where the enemy was. And so there is some anger. Well, it, it is incomprehensible. Now, there's a long and complicated history, which I don't want to go deep down, down the rabbit hole. But uh, Israel has, uh, in many ways, um, well, encouraged Hamas in, in, in the past that they saw, you correct me if I'm wrong about this, that they saw Hamas as a counterweight to uh, the Palestinian Authority, which was very, uh, which, which was, which has been weak. And as a result, there's been a little bit of pussyfooting around with, uh, with, with, with Hamas, a little bit of appeasement of, of Hamas. So that policy um, now has been utterly discredited. Obviously, a certain amount of naivete on the part of the Netanyahu administration that they thought that Hamas was not posing an immediate threat, that if they gave work permits to people in Gaza, somehow that that would l lessen the, the pressure. So they obviously did not understand what was about to happen in terms of the logistics of this attack, the missiles, the hang gliders, the, the bulldozers, all of that. But they also completely misread the, the mood of, 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 of Hamas. I mean, so this is like a multiple cascading sense of a uh, series of failures, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to comment too thoroughly on the history. I mean, there are yeah. people who will say Israel created Hamas. Yeah. Uh, I can't verify that yeah. sitting here. But, but, but in any case, uh, Israel has dealt with Hamas. There's an argument to be made that Israel needed to deal with Hamas mm -hmm. because it's just a reality. They mm -hmm. were there. They controlled some territory. It's territory that Israel withdrew from in 2005 and did not find it in its continuing interest to have a troop presence literally inside of of Gaza. And so they pulled away and, and built their walls. And Hamas is there. And you have to deal with them in the same way that you would have to deal with any group of people or just realities like the weather. I mean, it's a reality that there are these people who live there and feel that Israel is, or many of them feel that Israel is an illegitimate state. Yeah. And also know as just a matter of literal fact that they don't have equal rights, don't have freedom of travel, don't have a very free economy and are surrounded by walls. So you, you have this group that you need to deal with. And they did make an effort when possible to deal with Hamas and to deal with Palestinians in the West Bank, at least economically. This was part of Netanyahu's policy during his prior prime ministerships yeah. and part of what he's at least spoke for in the present one, that he was happy to encourage prosperity for Palestinians, but less and less willing to allow anything that looked even remotely like independence for, for Palestinians. I don't blame them for trying to deal with Hamas yeah. just as a reality, right. but they did not see the attack coming, that's for sure. So, so this is a far-right government, and since we're going to be talking about politics and the, and the messy business of, of, of politics, uh, Netanyahu presides over a far-right government that has engaged in um, you know, push policies that have really torn this country apart. I mean, there was actually talk about the possibility of maybe metaphorical civil war, but you had people in the security services, people in the military who were saying that, look, this is weakening the country. This is making the country more vulnerable. Um, this was as divided a country as we have seen since, I think, 1948. You, you may have a different impression. So to what extent did that contribute either to Hamas's perception that Israel was weak and divided or to the reality that, in fact, that that uh, Netanyahu and his small circle had become so isolated from, you know, the security services or people in the military that they weren't listening, that they weren't paying attention, that they had become disconnected from this apparatus. What do you think? I, I am reluctant to draw that conclusion, yeah. as many people instantly did, because you want to report, you want to be based right, on right. facts. But the reality is that the government did have a giant distraction, a very divisive distraction. I think about this often in terms of the United States. I even think of it in terms of the story of, of Lincoln. We create these giant distractions for ourselves, and we really need to be worrying about other things. Why did we spend the spring in a pointless debate over the debt ceiling when we pointless. needed to be paying attention yeah. to China? Why did we almost have a government shutdown when we needed to be paying attention to things? Why did we then have a dep you know, deposing the Speaker of the House and freezing the House of Representatives when there might be a crisis any minute and suddenly there was one? 
I mean, th this is a question that I ask. Why, why are we having a lot of the arguments that we have over cultural memes and social media messages when there are other more serious things to, to argue about? This is a question that I have. My research about Lincoln uh, makes me think about this too, because Lincoln tried to focus on one central goal. He's the president of the United States. There was a rebellion. He wanted to focus on that. He wanted to keep people united on that one goal, preserving the union. He tried to shove other controversies to the side, not always successfully, but he was trying for the one big goal. And there was a lack of strategic vision in some other instances in history that we can, we can mention. And while I am reluctant, as I said, to say the distraction in Israeli society made them more vulnerable, it is no doubt, though, a distraction from serious threats that they were aware were in the neighborhood. No, and also, I'm going to get to Lincoln in, in just a second. I, I thought it was interesting what uh, Ambassador Dermer told you um, when he was describing this forceful response. He, he said, the last time we saw something like this was when ISIS came out, out on the stage. You saw that in the trucks with these fighters wearing the jihadi banners going in indiscriminately, mowing down people. Um, this is an interesting analogy that, that what we are seeing is kind of ISIS writ large. We're seeing this new style of just pure, raw terror, aren't we? Uh, I don't know what to make of the civilian casualties here. Like I said, no matter how often it happens, I, n I never get yeah, used yeah. to it. And there is a bit of an analogy here as well, because we're talking about a group that has an identifiable strip of territory right. that they yeah. that they control. Right. Um, and that complicates the, the challenge of, of addressing it.